I'm going to record on my there we go and we're live welcome to college planning 101 um, my name is Bonnie Clefman I am an associate college consultant with Access College America among my many other roles that I play um, and let me introduce Mr. Dale Price who is our founder and owner and I'll let him say a word about himself as well Hey guys, welcome to College Planning 101. This is such an important topic. If you have a freshman or a sophomore, you are not early, you are right on time. Um, think about this, that when you apply to college, it's not the junior year or the senior year transcripts that you're sending. It's not just the junior year or the senior year resume that you're providing. You are showing the universities you're applying to a track record of every single thing that you have done, and you need to make sure that you are applying to colleges and universities with evidence of what's called intellectual curiosity. So we will definitely cover that. Uh, there is an opportunity to interact with us. Make sure that you post your questions in the chat box. I'm going to give a shout out to Round Rock High School. We've got folks here from Lhasa and Westlake. So go chaps. Um, so you can uh, submit your questions to us. You can uh, send them to the host and the panelists if you would like. Um, and then you can also put them in the Q&A, but go ahead and put them in the, uh, in the box for us. Absolutely. Take notes, take notes, take notes. Use the question and answer. We absolutely love when um, when you guys interact with us. It makes the presentation so much more fun to, to have audience, um, you know, really engaged. So that's really super duper cool. So our brief agenda for today, we have a lot going on, but let me begin with this, you guys. Okay, so um, let's go here to what college is and what college is not. And we're gonna come back to the, um, the agenda and all of that stuff. So this, these I feel like are really, really important points to hammer home from the beginning and throughout the process. College is so, can, the journey to college can be so much fun and so very meaningful because this is an opportunity for you to learn about the thing that you may well do for a career and the rest of your life. So it's your search and you have got to own it. So parents, I challenge you to take a half step back and scholars or students, we call the folks that we work with individually scholars. So scholars and student, I'm gonna use that word interchangeably Changeably. Um, you know, scholars take that step forward, parent take a step back. Scholar, it is your time to shine and to own this journey. Um, it's an invitation to explore your identity and your purpose, right? What do you want to do with your life? What impact do you want to make on the world? This is an important thing. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen to you. Uh, it, ha it happens because of you. Um, it's a human process. There's plenty of user error in selecting a college. That's why having a long runway. I'm really glad that we have several families here with um, you know ninth graders and 10th graders here. It's definitely not not too early, you're right on time. Um, lean into the process, as I said before, and it's exciting, you guys. Um, this is going to be the four years of high school is, is a time of enormous growth. It cognitively, physically even, right? Um, emotionally and socially, that growth continues exponentially in college. And developmentally, that's appropriate for adolescents, right? Spreading their wings, being away from home, maybe, um, and learning about the thing that's going to be their life's vocation. So this is really important. Um, it is very exciting if it becomes too tedious. Step back for a second, come on back to it in a little bit, take a break, get your studies done, get your head clear, and then come back and um, make sure that it is, you're open to all suggestions because it is very much full of choice, okay? There's a lot of choices in this process. So don't necessarily, and I'm going to hammer this point home so much during this presentation, do not necessarily go for only the colleges that you've heard of, the ones that your friends go to, the ones that your parents went to, the ones that you have in your mind that are popular. Open your mind. There are lots of colleges and universities in this country and beyond. So keep all of them as a possibility as you're beginning this journey. So what college is not? This is equally as important as the previous slide, you guys. Um, it's not a value judgment 
on if you're good enough, right? It is absolutely, let me say that again. It's not a value judgment on you as a human being. It is not where you get into is not who you are. So keep that in mind. The As we'll learn when Dale comes back on and talks about this, the application, um, you know, the reasonings why you may or may not get into a college could have absolutely nothing to do with the strength of your application. That sounds really weird, um, but sometimes, We'll, we'll go into it later, but it's not always um, a cut and dry process. It's also not always fair. I hate to tell you that, but it's really true. It's not always fair or predictable. So keep that in mind. It's not one size fits all. The advice or the, the information that we give um, to one family might be different from the information that is correct for another family. So keep that in mind too. As I said in the previous slide, it's not passive. It happens because of you, not to you, okay? You're in control, so you gotta drive this bus. Um, so there are many ways to a future too. It's not necessarily linear. Uh, four year college is not for every single student in the United States. Keep that in mind too, okay? Um, there are many roads to a sex successful career and college isn't perfect. There is never ever one right choice in college, right? Um, there, there might be several colleges in which you would fit in well and have a wonderful, wonderful educational experience. So definitely keep that in mind too. Um, all right, so let's go back just a second and talk about like some of the other stuff that we were going to go for today's agenda um, and COVID's impact. We're kind of almost out of the woods, but not all the way. So I'll go ahead and share here and Dale is going to take it for just a second. Yeah, thanks, Bonnie. And I just want to remind you guys that college planning, where you go to college in general, really is an intimate decision. It's a very personal decision. Where you go to college will be one of the biggest decisions you ever make in your entire life because it will last a lifetime. And moms and dads out there realize where you send your baby to college will be one of the most expensive, most precious gifts that you ever give them. You kind of want to get it right. You don't want to throw things up into the air and see where the paper falls. Um, so let me see. I don't think I can go to the next slide. Oh, uh, would updated. you like me to? Update. Yeah, if you'll go to the next one, update in the status of college admissions. Oh, um, there we go. Kind of let you guys know yeah, what's there we are. What's happening in the world of college admissions? Um, and there's been I, so many changes recently. You know, more students are applying to more colleges than ever before. And one of the reasons why more students are applying to more colleges than ever before, it's because of the advent of the common application, Go Apply Texas, the coalition application. There's this hysteria that folks aren't getting into the colleges that they would have normally got into in the past. Acceptance rates have really started to fall. And so moms and dads are out there pushing their kids to apply to 15, 20, 25 colleges because they're like, oh my gosh, we got to see what's going to stick. We don't recommend that approach, by the way. We recommend applying to a balanced list, keyword balanced list of six to eight schools with equal number of safeties, targets, and reaches. Um, I, I do want to show, tell you that universities absolutely love this part of what's happening in the world of college admissions. They love getting record-breaking uh, applications because it's a popularity contest out there, you guys. Let's just call a spade a spade. Colleges are a business. They're in the business of recruiting your college application to that university so they can reject a bunch of folks and show a really, really low acceptance rate. Let's look at it. The most popular colleges in America have the lowest acceptance rate. And, you know, public impression is reality for colleges and universities. And so the more applications, the lower the acceptance rate. And as I mentioned, universities are a business. They want to have a very, very high yield, which brings us to demonstrating interests. We saw last year that universities are putting a lot of interest in relationships and rapport. They don't want to get rejected. They want to know if they invite you to the party. Are you coming? So universities have uh, invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in software tracking systems in which they are actually uh, looking at, are you 
uh, uh, following them. I don't know if Bonnie, you're able to pull up the CDS for Tulane um, and we'll show them, if you're able to show them, how does a university, uh, how can you find out if a university is tracking demonstrating interest? Because you need to know if they are and if they aren't, because you need to be engaged with them. This is something that will be factored into your college application. And a lot of families out there are just assuming it's about grades and your test scores. While Bonnie is pulling up the CDS for Tulane, let me explain to you what that is. Universities are releasing to the public what's happening, who's getting admitted, what are the stats, what are the class ranks, how do you know if you're really gonna be competitive or not? You can literally Google uh, any university and look up the common data sets. And what you want to do is you'll see a history of PDFs. You want to go to the most recent year that's released. And section C is the admissions information. Section yep. C. Um, I've got it. I got it. I got it right here. here. And section C and right there under non-academic value, it says the level of the applicant's interest mm -hmm. is going to be considered, which is code word for you need to know your admissions officer. You should really consider an in-person visit or virtual visit. You want to start following them on social media, sign up to their newsletters, click on the links, and so forth. While we're here, so um, that is kind of the general status of admissions. And if one word could wrap it up, and don't go anywhere just yet, Bonnie, but if you could wrap up college admissions in one word, I would say it's ambiguous. Um, I would also say another good word for it is mysterious. There's a lot of unknowns out there and colleges are not going to be transparent, but it is a game and you do need to know how to play the game to beat the system and, and, and so forth. Bonnie, um, do you want to show them, by the way, one, one thing about the CDS is knowing basically what is a university going to evaluate, when, what do they care about? when you apply to that university. And as I demonstrated here, the level of the applicant's interest is important, but where do you find out what a competitive test score is and what does that look like? Yeah, good. okay, good. So we're still in the common data set. It's like over 30 pages long. Always click on the most recent um, academic year that they're able to do. So all you really have to do is Google common data set and um, the university or college, and you've got that. So right under C7, oh, rigor, rank, academic GPA, and standardized test scores are usually in the very important category. It's this other stuff that we generally look at here. But if we wanna scroll down to C9, some of them give it to us and some of them do not. Um, okay, so these are the percentage of student, this is the percentage of students, let me see if I can make it even larger, um, who submitted SAT and ACT scores here, and then here are the composite scores. Now, uh, inevitably, in every webinar, I'm going to pre-answer this question because I get it every time. What's a good SAT score? What's a good ACT score? The answer to that question has to do with what your goal score is and where you're going to apply. For example, if you have a 1490 on the SAT, 1490 or better, and you wish to apply to Tulane, well, I'm going to say that is a good test score for Tulane because um, 75th percentile is 1490. So the, the um, mean number in between 25 and 75, that's going to be your average 50th percentile, right? What we recommend to our scholars is generally to aim for that 75th percentile to make sure that your, um, your test score is as competitive as possible, right? Um, in this test optional landscape, um, the average admitted freshman test score is going up across the board, especially with test optional schools. Here's why only the good testers are sending their scores in, you guys. So of course the average test scores are going to go up. Now notice, you know, the 25th percentile, there were some students who got in with that 1380, but just as an example. So here's, here's how you know, I guess, what is a good test score per school? You gotta look at the school. All right, so while we're here, again, just like Dill said, um, we can go down and also see um, how, what is the academic profile? Now, sometimes they'll give you the, um, the 
grade point average for the class, sometimes they don't. But we can also see that like 95% of students that um, were accepted to Tulane as freshmen were in the top half of their graduating class and a full 54.17% were in the top 10th of their class. This speaks to the selectivity of the school um, because of course the students with the best grades, test scores, academic rigor, et cetera, those are the ones that they want to admit first, right? So as we can see, um, the majority of students here had a GPA of over 3.74 or, or 3.5, excuse me, or better. So, oh, here and here they do give you a, a an average GPA. Some of them don't, um, and I don't know why. So anyway, these are just a few things on the common data set that are um, that are worthy of of your time. Another one would be um, going down all the way to field F. Where's oh, I didn't nail it the first time. Darn. Okay, so check it. If you're looking for out of state, which many of our students are. Okay, so out of state students, percent who are from out of state. I love the out of state applicant. You're going to be favored at Tulane if you're out of state versus in state. So yeah, you kind of are. That's a little bit unusual. But yeah, um, I was speaking to a family earlier um, who was from, I think it was like New Jersey. And it, and anyway, it was it was kind of interesting because it's like they just moved here. But now the chances of getting into a school that's from their home state or what they still consider their home state is greater, which actually yeah. kind of made me laugh a little bit. Anyway, and, so like, and hold off on this screen right here. So, okay. you know, a, 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 th this is a good example of looking at those big state flagship universities, though. Take a look at places like Chapel Hill, uh, UGA, uh, NC State, University of California system. And you may have the stats to get into that university. You may have the GPA, the test, the, the test scores, um, the class rank, but after further research, you see that uh, they really admit a very, very small percentage of applicants from outside of their state. So you have to be even better than the typical applicant that's getting in. This is going back to having a balanced college list and mm -hmm. realizing is this school considered a safety target reach, or in some cases, even an extreme reach? Because there's so many surprises that are taking folks by storm these days. And here's the other, here's the other kicker. This data is old. You know, there's been a lot of things that have happened. This might be, what is this from? This is from the fall of 21. We don't have the stats from the fall of 22. And they took an overwhelming number of students to lane did by their early decision. Uh, so a lot of things that will change in two years from the data that we have here, it's just going to get that much more competitive. Mm -hmm. So understand how to read the common data set, understand where to go to look at the stats, understanding whether or not you're a majority applicant coming from a highly academic high school. So for example, Bonnie, um, I don't know if you want to pull up the CDS for the University of Texas. We have so many students that apply uh, to the University of Texas. I kind of had these stats memorized. Um, but um, if we take a look at the University of Texas and we want to look at um, the most recent data reported from the fall of 22, these are this is the stats from the most recent freshman class. Um, we know uh, based off of C9, section C9. And for those of you that have just joined us, going to the common data set, looking at section C will tell you a lot of information. But C9 is where the SAT and the ACT stats are. And a 1480 um, is going to be in the 75th percentile range. Um, yep, if you just sorry, you're yep, fine, 1480. you're all good. You got yeah, it. 1480 or a 34. Um, ACT composite means that you have a competitive score for the University of Texas. Doesn't mean you're getting in, by the way. And if you are a majority applicant from a highly academic high school, I'm looking at folks from Lhasa when I say this. I'm looking at folks from Westlake when I say this. Uh, a 1480 is not going to be really that competitive for some of the most competitive majors out there like the Macomb School of Business, getting in there, uh, Cockrell School of Engineering, uh, Computer Science and Natural Sciences. I would say you probably want to go north of these stats. So majority applicants are those college applicants that are overrepresented in the applicant pool, 
universities uh, will receive more applications from those that are white, Indian American, or Asian American. And when you're coming from high schools like Westlake, Westwood, Lhasa, everyone is applying to the exact same colleges and universities. And guess what? They're applying to the same majors. So these universities can really skim from the top. So you need to understand where to find the stats. And even then, I would still say some of this is probably going to be uh, changing as well. So understand what you're up against. Okay, Bonnie, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and continue with um, the moderation. Make sure that you put your questions in the chat box, um, and I'm answering them and also putting resources as well. I hope that this has been helpful, though. All righty. So, um, I, gosh, D what Dale was just saying, like, there's so much more to know about about um, this stuff and admissions, um, admissions chances. Okay, let me say this as well. Um, with the advent of test optional policies, that has allowed more students to um, to apply to more schools. We have the common application where it's easy to click. Yes, I'm going to apply to more schools, et cetera. So, um, so the, um, the common, it, ugh, excuse me, um, when we um, apply, to, when students from high school apply to the same colleges, it's a little bit difficult for us to know what they're selecting. The test optional policy has allowed more minority applicants to apply to more colleges because it used to be that students who did not have access to extensive test prep or super competitive um, high school coursework would self-select out of certain um of certain schools simply because they thought they didn't have the test scores to get in. So now that that barrier is removed, uh, admissions officers are receiving much, much, many more applicants from different applicant groups. This is good in terms of diversity, but again, if you're a majority applicant, they can't, you know, UT cannot take 25% of its freshman class from Lhasa, okay? They can't take 25 of, its, of the freshman class from you know, Round Rock or any of these high schools, right? The admissions officer's job is to build a balanced class, right? So they need a certain number of international students. They need a certain number of students from Wisconsin and from Montana. And so if you're from a busy state, a busy part of the country, a busy high school uh, with that sends lots of applicants to a particular place, that's gonna be significant for you, okay? Um, yeah, they wanna build a diverse class. So let me look back. I think we have covered most of the things on um, on our first uh, thing, which was how different it is since um, you know the the different admissions trends. Right. Let me mention one other thing too, in terms of testing and looking up your test scores, etc. Um, if you are going to apply to a school that is test optional, and I want to make sure that you check with that school in this, if you're looking at applying here in the fall, check check right before you apply or check check what right what when you're researching if the school is going to stay test optional we've had a few who've waffled lately who said okay no we're going to require a test maybe we will maybe we won't so understand that it's great to understand that now if you're a junior so that you can get your testing plan in order if you're planning to submit those scores a poor test score will always be easy elimination okay i'm, I'm just saying that's just a fact okay um you cannot uh, you, you won't get in if you are um, if your test score is well well below that average and you go ahead and send it so it's just a, it's an elimination tool but it can be a, a point in your favor if you have an excellent test score so the things that applicate that admissions officers look for most in your application like what weighs the most right we have your grade point average weighted or unweighted i would suggest putting the weighted into your common an app. However, many admissions officers will take your GPA, take your transcript, and recalculate based on your core coursework or what they're looking for. So I, I really don't know which colleges do that and which do not, but they will recalculate. So 
Um, keep that in mind that sometimes they do that for weighted or unweighted. Um, so your, your grades matter. Your, the academic rigor of the courses you select in high school. That's one thing that we work with our individual um, scholars with a lot, especially we encourage them to start early so that we can make an academic plan that lasts, you know, that we go from the senior year backward. If the student has some idea of maybe what they might want to be when they grow up or what they want to major in, um, we can point that coursework toward the intended major that they want to apply to. Now, I understand many ninth and 10th graders don't know what they want to do when they grow up, and that's absolutely fine. We do offer um, career exploration and I encourage every you know eighth ninth and tenth grader to explore lots of different different um, avenues to explore what they might be interested in what are their favorite subjects in school and what they might wish to study so academic planning very very important so um, again I said the um, the um, grade point average then the transcript and the academic rigor. Now, for those of you who are just are kind of new to our webinars, academic rigor is how difficult the classes your student has taken versus what is offered at the high school. So if your high school only offers two or three AP classes and you've taken one, two or three of those, that's okay. It's not gonna be counted against you when you are measured against other students from other high schools. However, if your student has the ability to take higher level honors AP courses, um, then I'm gonna say they absolutely should if they have the ability, simply because colleges do evaluate applications on academic rigor. They wanna see that the students are academically interested, that they're willing to try hard and try those difficult classes. So take uh, my advice um, across the board, take the most rigorous courses that you can succeed in. And that's with like an A or an A minus, maybe a B here or there, but take the most academically challenging classes that you can get to, okay? Um, then what are they, what else do they look at in that college application? Well, your class rank does play a role, although less so, I think, just a scotch than the other things um, that I just mentioned, the, the rigor and the um, academic GPA. I don't love class rank. Just as a human being, I don't love it because it has to do more with what other people are doing than what you are doing. However, it does play a role. But going back to what Dale was saying about very busy state flagships, for example, um, in Texas, there is the, six, the top 6% 6 rule for um, University of Texas. You are guaranteed admit if you're in the top 6% of your class. You are not guaranteed the major that you want. OK, just because you're getting in doesn't mean you are definitely going to get into the program that you wish to get into. Same with your other state flagships in Texas, the 10 percent rule. Right. You can get into the college, but that does not mean you're going to get into the school or academic program that you prefer. OK, so just definitely keep that in mind. Um, now, what other ways are our college application uh, our college applications evaluated? Well, we have tests, of course, test scores. Some places are test optional. So many colleges now have gone to what's known as a holistic review. So they are going to look, give a little bit more weight than they have in the past to your short answer questions, your main essay, um, your extracurricular activities, your volunteer work, et cetera, um, and uh, other, uh, your letters of recommendation, okay? So these things, when a test is, is testing is eliminated, it's kind of like a stool. A stool usually has four legs, but if you take away one of those legs, then the other three legs are going to have to bear more weight. So in the, the holistic review process, I'm going to say, that the essay and short answer questions and other things on that application matter a little bit more than they have in the past with a holistic review, okay? Um, so one thing that, that uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about um, demonstrating interest. So we talked a little bit in the beginning about how we can demonstrate interest 
at a particular college or university, right? Did you go to the um, to the college fair when they came to your school if they had one? Did you seek out an admissions officer either virtually or on campus for a brief meeting? Did you visit campus and take a tour? Are you on their mailing list? Do you open their emails? Trust me, they actually track that, which seems a little creepy, but they really do. Um, so demonstrating interest there. Another thing though with demonstrating interest is to have you demonstrated interest in the major that you're applying to. So for example, if you wanna do engineering and STEM, have you taken the highest level math offered in your school? Have you taken the highest level sciences available to you or at a level you can achieve, um, achieve well at, right? Have you um, done some extracurricular activities, joined some clubs, maybe done a capstone project or a massive open online course that has to do with an area of interest? When an admissions officer looks at your application, they're checking it out like, okay, does this student read like an engineering major? Do they read like a history major? Do they read like a journalism major? Have they done things to indicate that that is their academic area of interest? Now that sounds kind of crazy, right? Of course, you know, if, you're, if your journalism is going to be your major, maybe you're gonna be in the journalism club or theater, same thing, you're gonna be in the high school play. But um, like, what other things can you do? We've had a lot of cancellations of things in the last two years, right? Our extracurricular activities have not been what they have been in the past. Well, this is where you can get creative and take learning into your own hands. So my, for my ninth graders out there in the audience, my 10th graders who are kind of wondering, geez, what can I do in high school um, to really expand my intellectual curiosity to learn about things that I might be interested in for a career? Well, there's awesome things called MOOCs, Massive Open on Online Classes. You can use Coursera. You can use Khan Academy. Um, there are many different free online courses that you can take to learn more about a subject that is interesting to you. You can read a series of books on this and then do a paper or um, a capstone project in relation to it. Um, if, for example, I have a student right now who's doing a massive open online course. She's taking the course on data analytics and on Excel, and then she's going to create uh, a survey, analyze the data, and do a paper and a vlog about it, and that's going to be her capstone project. I love the idea. It's homegrown. It's free. She doesn't have to, um, you know, go and spend thousands of dollars to be on a college campus for a week, um, and, and that's going to look great on her resume. It's going to be a wonderful growth and learning experience for her. Um, as a consultant, and as a mom, I would never recommend doing a thing, a club, a sport or whatever, only for your college application. If you hate the thing, don't do it just because it looks good on your application. Do the things that you enjoy, that you're passionate about, that light you up, right? That are gonna teach you something valuable for your future, okay? So keep that in mind when you're thinking about these massive open online classes. Um, explore some things that you love because let's say you think you wanna go into engineering. You're a 10th grader. You take um, an engineering class at school, you liked it pretty well, and you're like, okay, so may, am I going to do electrical or am I going to do chemical? And you take an open online class on chemical engineering and you hate it. You quit after six hours. Well, you know what? Great. You spent six hours on that and not four years and $100,000. So that was a great learning experience. And I'm going to call that a win, right? Okay. Oh, I have a question coming in here on my chat. All right. Um, how many colleges should a student apply to? Okay. <laughs> That's a really, really good question. Dale, do you want to take that one? I see you popping back in. What you think? Good question. Yeah, I'm glad they asked that question. And we actually have a few others that are coming through okay, for cool. you as well. And I want to make sure I get to these. I think that one thing I want the parents to understand is that, you know, when we applied to college, colleges and universities had that whole concept of finding you the student that was well-rounded. And as long as you had the grades and the test scores, you pretty much got in. Um, but nowadays, student, these colleges and universities are not just looking for consumers of activities, but they're looking for generators of activities. And something that Bonnie is discussing with you is ways to generate intellectual curiosity for your college applications. 
opportunities to try on majors and careers before you actually start at the university. And one of the things that we do uh, with our scholars is, you know, a lot of times we recommend um, these capstone, uh, uh, these uh, Coursera like capstone, or I'm sorry, massive open online classes. You can go to Coursera.org uh, uh, and you can literally type in any subject in here. Um, and you'll see that there are lots of really great free classes that you can take. Here's one now on uh, an, uh, anatomy. And these are free. Now this right here says it's gonna take approximately five months to complete. So I would absolutely not do that one. I would recommend that you change the duration, something you can do, you know, maybe one to four weeks or one to three months max. This is free, it's not for a grade. But here are the classes. Here's one from UNT on contemporary biology. It's only 10 hours to complete. You start and stop when you want. It's And you get a certificate when you're done in this subject from the University of North Texas. So MOOCs are massive open online classes. You can look at this through Coursera. You can go to edX. You can go to masterclass.com and type in really any subject that you're interested in studying uh, in the top box. And this will allow you to explore content uh, that you may be interested in doing later in life. The other thing that you have to realize is that by getting a certificate, from this platform, you can actually include that on your resume and you have again, experience and evidence now uh, that in your free time, you created a learning experience that is directly related to the major uh, you wanna go into. So um, that is something that you wanna be thinking about is over time, over the next few years, how are you able to demonstrate that? Um, and Bonnie, one of the questions that we had here is, says, hi, Miss Bonnie, thank you for doing these. They're so helpful. I'm interested in going into biology. My senior year, should I take multivariable calculus or AP stats? I'm in BC now as a junior. Oh, That's crazy. BC as a junior is impressive. Yeah. I, okay. So to me, if you're that advanced in math already, I'm going to go with multivariable all day. Okay. If you're okay. So for my, my STEM majors, okay. I'm talking to you STEM majors, um, getting to calculus of, of some level by your senior year, um, calculus for many of my STEM majors is a weed out class freshman year in college, right? If you've not had calculus as an engineering major and you actually happen to get admitted to an engineering major and you haven't had that, you're probably going to change your major because the rest of the students, you're not gonna be able to hang, right? So um, my STEM majors get to the top of the math and science offerings at your schools. So, I mean, if you wanna take AP stats as an extra elective because you find that interesting, do it. But um, cal um, multivariable all day. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're applying to highly selective colleges and universities, like if you're applying to really great schools that tend to have a 50% plus acceptance rate, then you can go backwards in rigor, maybe by picking AP stats as opposed to multivariable. Multivariable calculus is a post-cal class. It's extremely rare um, that many places offer this. And I bet you, if you ask any admissions officer reading your college application, did you take multivariable calculus? The answer will probably be no. Um, but you know, families watching this, you need to understand that when you when you submit your college application, What's going to follow that application is called a school profile. And the admissions officer that has been assigned to your high school is going to know, first of all, how do you line up with the other peers at your high school? How, do you how are you able to compete with them? Uh, they're going to know the resources and the curriculum you had access to and what did you do with your time? That's important. But additionally speaking, Anything STEM-based, especially at a highly competitive college, highest level of math and highest level of sciences kind of is the table stakes. I mean, engineering, Bonnie, as you just mentioned, if you're interested in getting into engineering, uh, for example, um, you know, LASA has Physics C. Every junior takes Physics 1 and 2. I would not go backwards your senior year and do APES or Anatomy and Physio or, you know, um, or even AP Chem. 
it would be expected that you would do physics C your senior year. So academic sequencing is extremely important. Another question that came through is on average, how much time does an admissions officer spend reviewing an application? Oh my gosh. Um, in, in a first round read, I hate to say this, maybe four minutes, maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's pretty, I mean, you know, just, I mean, to get past the gatekeeper, it's pretty fast and easy. I mean, the person reading your application that has been assigned to your high school, they're going to see your transcripts come through. And in, in minutes, they'll know, first of all, you're even competitive. They'll look at your GPA, your class rank, your high school. They're going to look at the major that you're wanting to apply to. They'll see your test scores if you sent them. It can mean a very quick elimination just on those merits alone. So it's pretty fast. Um, and then the second read it tends to take the longest amount of time. That's where your essays come into play. The readers will read your main essay, your short answer questions, your expanded resume as well. So I will say typically if you get a full read from first and second reviewers around eight minutes, maybe is how long you have. Um, now at those larger flagship institutions like the University of Texas, uh, you know, you don't have one person deciding everything. Again, you go through multiple rounds. But at other colleges, these are most often smaller liberal art universities. You'll have one read and it'll be your admissions officer that will be deciding everything. All the more reason, especially if that liberal arts college is already a reach for you, you want to have an ally inside the Office of Admissions, connecting with the university, having an opportunity to understand and meet your admissions officer so that when they read your application, if there's any blemish on there, you have had an opportunity to explain that to them. Bonnie, a um, little bit random, but we're going to switch gears with this question. This parent sure. is wanting to know, do you have any tips on how and when to negotiate merit scholarships? I guess this parent is a, has a senior right now, and they're okay. kind of wrapping things up. So how do you negotiate? Can you negotiate scholarships? Well, um, you can, you can a little bit and let's, I mean, okay, we have a whole nother webinar on financial aid and reading, um, reading offer letters. Um, so be careful when you're reading your, your offer letters, but you can negotiate aid a little bit. Okay. You can, um, by simply very kindly and politely letting them know that you've had a different or better offer from another school. Now, you whatever answer they give, you kind of have to accept it, but um, it is a little bit negotiable, okay? So you can come back, if, especially if you have an offer of, of scholarship or aid from another school that's kind of in the same, um, in the same amount of competitiveness, um, you can go back and negotiate that a little bit um, by saying, hey, you know, this, this university is indeed my first choice. I'm having a little bit of trouble with the, um, you know, the financial piece here. Uh, is there anything that you guys can do that, um, you know, to uh, help me be able to come to your school because it is indeed my first choice, but as well, make sure that you have a good balanced list, a couple of safeties, a couple of reaches, um, maybe some um, maybe a bunch of target schools in there so that you'll get acceptances from several places and you can really make an informed compared decision. But um, for more information on that, um, on that topic and comparing award letters, because they're confusing, there is no standard format. And that kind of makes me mad a little bit. I was had a scholar today that was like, is this good? And I'm like, well, where's the free money and where's the loans? But anyway, um, so that. yeah, yeah. Come to that webinar and you'll learn more about that. Just start off. It's all I'm always curious by the parents who are shopping for colleges and they don't understand what is the family scholarship. They don't know what their EFC is, their expected family contribution. And it's a little bit like buying a home. You kind of know what neighborhoods you belong in. And it's interesting for families that flip the approach, start shopping for colleges and have no clue what neighborhood they belong in. One of the very first things we do is we understand what is the affordability factor with the family. We start with the budget. 
Uh, let's get an idea of what your EFC is, your expected family contribution. Let's build a balanced college list around that number. When it's time to negotiate for merit aid or need-based financial aid, you can cluster the colleges together, safeties, targets, and reaches, and you can pair them against each other so that colleges are bidding against other colleges that are in the same league if you're getting shortchanged. Okay, uh, Bonnie, go ahead and let you take over. No, 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 that, that's, to that's totally cool. So no, I, I, I was just thinking like, as I was writing in the chat, like a note or two, um, EFC is your estimated family contribution. That is what the government or your FAFSA, Federal Application for Student Aid, that's what the government expects your family to be able to pay for college. So there's that, and then there's institutional aid where you can apply to the college for financial aid. But um, yeah, definitely keep price in mind. What we advise our scholars when we're, when we're kind of like in the beginning of the process is there's three elements of fit that we talk about. So the goal here is not to go to the most popular place, like we said in, in the beginning, right? The goal is not to go, um, to go to the place that your friends are going to or the place that's necessarily nearest or further away. The goal is to find a place that fits your you, your scholar and your family socially, academically, and financially, okay, the three elements of fit that are really, really important, you guys. So um, academic fit, we've talked about a lot. That's your stuff on the common data set. Where do you fit in in relation to the freshman, the, in, the freshman class, right? How do you fit in academically? Is this school going to be a place where you can succeed? Okay, seriously. Um, some of these schools, if, if everybody at the school has a higher stats than you, that, um, you know, that might may mean that going to this college could be a, a bit of a struggle, right? Um, as well as social fit. Do you want to live in a place that's, uh, you know, a small city? Or do you want to go to like, a college that could be a city in itself? Are you an Ohio State person? Or would you rather live in a smaller town, right? Are you a Denison University kind of liberal arts small person? Do you want to be a big or a small town person? Um, do you want to be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond, right? That also has to do with in what environment and what do you learn best? There are many colleges out there, you guys, that will have classes that are smaller than those in your high school. For undergraduate, I went to a smallish, uh, small-ish um, university. I went to University of Dayton in Ohio, right? Um, and in my senior seminar philosophy class, there were five students. It was amazing, right? Not a huge place, um, not a huge college, but some of my my college my classes that were in my major were tiny. It was amazing. The relationships that I built with those professors was really, really great. And in the same with graduate school. I went to a small graduate school as well, and it's wonderful. Um, but then, you know, there are some people for whom a large environment is where they absolutely thrive, and they do not mind being in a lecture hall for some of those basic classes. And that's cool, too. Uh, distance from home, that's an important thing too. And that can also speak to budget, you guys. Are, is this plane tickets every six months or every three months or two months? Um, you know, is it, some, is it um, a student who's really eager to get away from home and far away or do they want to, um, you know, kind of stick a little bit closer? Um, remember parents, it's your student's decision not yours. I know you probably want to keep baby at home for a little bit longer, but um, and this also has to do with financial. In-state schools are generally less expensive on the sticker price than out-of-state schools. However, they, you can get merit aid at any school if you are qualified, so keep that in mind. As well, if you want to go to school in Montana and you're living in um, you know, Florida, they might need a certain number of students from Florida to build that diverse and balanced class. So don't necessarily take out of state schools if they're in your wheelhouse, don't necessarily take them off because of the price, um, but that can be a big consideration. Okay, so that was social fit. Uh, um, uh, financial fit, as Dale just talked about. Financial fit is hugely important. You would not go to a car lot without knowing about how much you're going to want to spend. And that same thing applies to college. So um, you will, um, you'll have to take a look at that, see what your debt tolerance is as a family, because mom and dad, you're probably going to be taking on the, a good bit of this debt. Um, to for an education. And so here's where I put on my career specialist hat for a second. 
um, depending on your major and depending on the expected earnings of the first jobs or career that you want after college. Like, why are you going to college? First of all, the career specialist hat. Why are you going to college? What do you want to study? What do you want your life to be like? And what field or major is going to fulfill you as a human being and, and allow you to contribute what you want to contribute to this world? Um, so understanding what's the return on investment here. I would never advise somebody to go into $200,000 worth of debt for a teaching certificate. Why? Because, or a teaching degree, a four-year um, you know, degree for secondary education. Why? Because teacher salaries are published. We know that that's not a high paying profession, rewarding in many ways but not necessarily a high paying profession. So if you saddle yourself with an enormous amount of student debt for a profession that historically doesn't pay an enormous amount, that's gonna be a problem for you and you're gonna be setting yourself up for a pretty difficult time um, in the several, many 10, 15 years after graduation. Um, another point for my career specialist hat, and then I'll take that hat off and we'll get on with the presentation, um, is that you're, you want to look at employment data for the field that you're gonna go into. Look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is an important thing. Um, look at Bureau of Labor Statistics for the field of study that you want to do. Are, is this a growing field? Are the jobs that you're targeting after graduation, do these have, are there lots of jobs? Is it a, is it a growth area? Because what you don't wanna do is go into a field that, in which the, the um, number of jobs is steadily declining. There's great resources on the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You can search by region and by pay level as well. Like how much are you gonna get paid if you work in this field in this state or that, or this region of the country? So important stuff. All right, I'm taking that hat off. I know we have another question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. The questions keep coming in. Um, okay. Can you explain, this one is on letters of recommendation. We have a, several juniors that are here with us, I would imagine. Can you explain who should write your letters of recommendation? Awesome. Okay. So I'm talking to you juniors. Right now is the time your eyes should be perking up at some of your favorite teachers and the ones who know you best, whether or not you have struggled in their classroom and they've seen you overcome a difficulty, or if you're just that leader in the classroom, you got like five more weeks to become one, right? So um, at, be thinking about who your letters of recommendation, your teacher should be to recommend you. Okay, generally um, we ask that our scholars ask for two letters of recommendation from core subject teachers. And that's history, English, science, math, or foreign language, okay? Oftentimes too, schools or scholarships will require a counselor recommendation. So do not, especially if you're at a large high school, don't let when you ask your counselor for their recommendation, don't let that be the first time they meet you. Go and say hello, ask them a question, come and, come and you know, talk about your life just a little bit. Don't be a stranger to them, right? Um, and when you present, um, your request for um, a letter of recommendation, do so well in advance of the deadline, do so most politely and perhaps with a nice little note of thanks, um, and then a note of thanks when they are finished. You will, you will not know what they say about you, but um, I guarantee an awesome, polite, smiley, grateful student is more likely to get a great recommendation as well. Give them a brag sheet, give them a resume when you do this, because every teacher you've ever had is not going to know all the awesome stuff about you. Pro tip, you can highlight certain achievements with certain teachers. So if you're gonna do your math teacher and your science teacher, you may give each one a brag sheet that highlights certain accomplishments of yours so that the letters don't look the same. Mm -hmm. yep. uh -huh. cool. And yeah. we are recording today's broadcast, by the way. So don't worry, I have a feeling we got folks out there that are like writing and taking tons of notes. Um, the timeline, we like to have our junior scholars verbally request letters of recommendation by the end of their junior year. So right about between now and the end of May, you want to start thinking about those recommenders kindly asking the faculty member if they would be willing to write you a letter, not because you need it now, um, but because a lot of teachers are going to fill up. Um, a lot of teachers will only write maybe 50 letters of recommendation. And once they're full, they're full and you don't want to get ghosted from your favorite teacher. And the beginning of the school year is the busiest time of the school year. So giving that faculty member an opportunity to work on that letter over the summer can really play to your strengths. Now, make sure that you're dancing with your school's policy too. 
too. For example, example, Lhasa is awesome. They have a really great way of managing this. You cannot ask for letters of recommendation at the end of the junior year. Uh, there is an actual formality in which you go about it. They have their own BRAC sheets for that matter. But for those other high schools out there where you, there is no BRAC sheet, there are no rules, it's first come first serve and it's the hunger games to get those letters of recommendation. You wanna get ahead of the rush. This other question I'm getting is, um, when is a good time to start college planning? I feel like we're behind and my kid is only a sophomore, but he wants to apply to UT for engineering. Help, Fani. <laughs> okay, um, all right, so college planning, okay. Um, yes, you should get started right now, but you're not necessarily behind, okay? Um, the student seems to have a great um, handle on what they want to be and what they want to major in. That's often a great thing to work on in the ninth and 10th grade year. So we have that base covered. But what we're going to want to do with this scholar or student is to make sure that their academic plan is solid. They have a great course plan going forward in, in high school, um, that they, um, they're doing the things over the summer and next summer maybe joining some extra if they're depending on their level of involvement at school are they involved in the in the right things and things that interest them are they giving back to their community um so you're not behind necessarily but um yeah getting started thinking about it planning for it taking it in small chunks um parents don't talk about college planning every single day. Your student will tune you out, I promise. Um, you know, but maybe set aside a time. Okay, so we're gonna talk about and have a meeting every month and talk about this. We're gonna talk about this and kind of get the plan rolling and what you need to do and start researching. Give the process to the student. Let yep. them drive the bus. It's, yeah. it's not your bus to drive, mama. And I think that, that you'll get a different answer based off who you ask when is really the right time to do this. Um, you know, so different consultants will tell you different things. We tend to work with scholars who are interested in applying to STEM-based majors. Um, and almost everybody we work with, and we work with everybody, by the way, not just those that want to apply to UT and not just those that want to apply to engineering or but a, lar a large share of who we work with are planning on applying to the University of Texas, do want STEM majors. And in that case, because the University of Texas has a holistic review, the clock starts ticking the freshman year. Every single thing you do as an incoming freshman will be part of your college application, right down to how you spend your summers. So we recommend having a very long runway before takeoff. You don't want to take off your junior year and have nothing uh, provided in terms of evidence or a fit to major. You want to start developing that story kind of early on. And as Bonnie said, the reality is we're not applying to college tomorrow. So we don't meet that often the first two years of high school, but we're there to cover the fundamentals and the basics, career exploration, academic sequencing, mapping out your summers. Let's make sure that your learning experiences don't stop in May. They continue in June, July, and August. And we also do have to have that conversation about standardized tests. A solid score can help you in the uh, admissions field. So there's some basics and fundamentals that we cover in the first couple of years of high school just to make sure the cards are falling together junior year of high school. And if you have UT on the list or Rice or a and or any college, um, let's go for it. Let's go for gold. Let's aim high. But we at least know that by working with us the first two years of high school, you also are falling in love with your safeties and your targets. Um, Bonnie, somebody is asking a question about the webinars and how to find the schedule. Do you want to do a quick screen share? And I think yeah, it's about time I'm, to wrap I'm up. pulling it up right now because I can't believe we're out of time. This went so fast. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen right now. And I'm sorry if there are any questions we didn't get to. Ah, we get so busy on these and it's fine. It's, it's actually, I, I find these so much fun. Um, okay, so this is um, our website and I'm not gonna insult your intelligence by teaching you how to navigate it. However, if you want to attend more of our webinars, which they're, I mean, they're free, get all the information you can. That's why we do it to, to help you guys, okay? Go to attend a webinar. There's our very attractive staff and you can come down here and see. 
Let's see, today is Wednesday the 20th. So here's today. I have another one coming up on Saturday about award-winning essays. And here is the list. We have some um, for applying to the University of Texas at Austin, career connections. I love that one because I'm the career specialist. But yeah, we have so many, so many great webinars and even archived resources. If you want to go here, look at our blog. Um, Dale and I have been writing blogs for a, a while now. Um, check these out for sure. And as well, if you want to um, become a part of our winning team and have a free consultation um, for our um, for um, individual services with us. Simply go here to um, the schedule session and then book a consultation request complimentary 30 minutes if you're interested in learning more about being our scholar. All right, so let me look in. Yeah, okay, so we have um, that information in the chat. So I just want to sincerely say thank you to everyone who has come to hang out with us tonight. And I hope maybe I'll see you Saturday if you want to learn more about essays. Um, that would be for my rising senior class, right? The students who are just about to finish their junior years. Now's the time. Get that essay done. We're preventing writer's block before it even <laughs> happens. So. Two things before we go. So make sure that you save the chat. You can literally click on the chat box. There's three little dots in the bottom corner and you can copy and paste everything, all the resources that we posted into a Word document or email. So save the chat. Bonnie, this is a big weekend for us because what do you have on? Well, you've got two things happening this weekend. Oh, I have you? fun! I, yeah, we, I got a. I have a big weekend. I have a couple of scholars. I think I got a. I can't remember my schedule. Off. Oh, the Friday I have a couple of scholars that I'm working with, and then I'm going to be doing the um, award-winning essays webinar. And then for our scholars, we have this. This is an exclusive benefit for the students that work with us. Our scholars. I'm doing an essay lab, and it's like. What is that, by the ooh, way? Okay. What is an essay lab? SA Lab is cool. SA Lab is where we work with our students in a, in a virtual classroom setting, and we actually help them get started on writing their essay, generating the idea for the essay, looking at a couple structures that work, teaching them how to um, I figure out what to write about because it's not the same as an English or history paper. It's not data analysis. It's not, um, you know, research. It is about you. And that's a hard thing to, you think it wouldn't be hard to write about, but it is. So that's happening Saturday. And then on Sunday, I am going to be doing a, um, a college research lab in which our scholars will take a deep dive into the resources that we have that we recommend they use to build their college list. So college list building um, begin can begin at any age. Whenever a scholar starts with us, we will go ahead and um, recommend that they attend the lab for college research where we dive deep into all the stuff and then they can be on their way. All righty. Well, thank you so much. Um, I will see you all later and hopefully you guys can join me in another webinar if you want to be our scholar that would be awesome too i'm going to stop the recording and we'll see you next time guys